Hallelujah. And we praise your name, Father. And there are 10,000 things that we can just sit down right now and proclaim in thanksgiving to you for what you have done for us. And most of all, Lord, we want to praise you for who you are. You are so gracious, so kind, so loving, so strong. You give us all that we stand in need of to be the followers of Jesus that we're called to be. And as we sit here this morning and stand and sing and praise and see all the children gathered on the stage, Lord, it's, it's just great to see everybody here. And we praise your name together and we celebrate ministry, ministry that can happen through this church. We're so thankful. And we're also humbled, Lord, because we need you so much. Because while we're, while we're singing 10,000 reasons to praise you, Sometimes we have a hard time getting along with the person that's sitting next to us. And so, Lord, we pray that even in these next few moments before we come to this table that's spread, that you would work in our hearts to be the community that you've called us to be, to be the community that's filled with unity of purpose in following our Savior together. So, Lord, I ask that you convict us, that you break down walls that need to be broken down, that truly this place would radiate for Jesus because of the way that we live in community together. We love you. We bless your name. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. amen. You could expend energy by sitting down, but I'm going to ask you to stand again. So if you take out your Bibles, and uh, we're going to be reading a psalm today, Psalm 133. It's not very long. While you're opening up your Bibles, if you have a bulletin, there's an outline in there, and you can get that all out and ready as well, and that'll help as we, uh, as we go through God's Word this morning. Psalm 133. We'll read God's word together. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. By the way, sisters are included in that as well. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore. May God bless this word to our hearts. You may be seated. We're, we've been in a series for the past few weeks called Engage, seeking to be the radiant church that Christ has called us to be. And so as we have been seeking to get re-engaged in this, as this new ministry year begins, we talked about grace and what a privilege that we have to extend grace to this community. And you know, it's great to see everybody in here this morning, but we're still going to be committed to filling all these seats for two services. Amen? Because people need Jesus. And then we also talked about being engaged in discipleship. Jesus' words to us were simply, follow me. Follow me, and we're going to be world changers. And so the following uh, begins with us communicating with others and discipling others and finding that Timothy, finding that Paul in our life, and continue to grow. And so there's a ministry fair out there this morning, and it is going to be unbelievably hot when you go out there. <laughs> but you're going to go out there, right? And we're going to smile, and we're going to sweat and perspire. Women will glisten. And, but, but we are going to go out there, and we're, we're going to celebrate. And so I just want to challenge you all to go out there. And there's going to be some of you that are desperately in need of some of the ministries that are out there because you need to receive what they're bringing. There are others of you that need to go out there because you need to give and you need to help with one of those ministries. And then there are others that I just, I just want to challenge you to walk around and just bless the people behind those tables. Because this is what we get to do as a church. And on one Sunday of the year, we set up all those tables and we even give you burgers for a reward. But this represents how the light of Christ is going out from this place throughout the year. So I hope that together we celebrate as a church this morning with our ministry fair. Amen? Well, today, thank you for clapping. 
clap by going out there in a little while. So this morning, we're going to talk about community. And it sounds like a really nice thing to talk about, but I, I'm going to say right out, this is a tough subject. It's a real tough subject because what happens is, is we sometimes have a hard time getting along. Amen? It's not just this place. How many denominations are there in the world? A bajillion? I was with my family all week this week, and that was a rare privilege for my wife. We were on vacation, and they were all there around the table together, and I just celebrated that so much. Our oldest son is 29 years old. We have one grandchild. It was great to sit around the table together. And you know what I'm grateful for? I'm grateful that even though we're different, even though that we have disagreed at times as a family, none of my boys ever pushed away from the table one day and said, I'm finding myself a new family. <laughs> Never once have my wife and I ever looked at them and said, we are trading you in for some other kids. <laughs> because family doesn't do that, right? But so often in the church we do that. And we're willing to just push away from the table and say, no more. And then we come to this psalm, and we read this psalm, and I have to say, I've read this psalm hundreds and hundreds of times, and every time I read it, I'm struck with the first impression of all that oil all over the beard, what's so big about that? It just seems a little bit odd at first reading, oil all over the beard, do, what's this all about? But I believe that this passage is extremely significant for us this morning. So we're just going to unpack Psalm 133 for a few moments, and then I want to give you some good handles when it comes to community. Because this text this morning speaks not only to the church, but it speaks to individuals as well. So David wrote this psalm. David wrote this psalm most likely at a time in his life when he came to rule. Initially when he came to rule as king, the kingdom was divided. And then the kingdom came together and he ruled from Jerusalem. Now this was very significant. And so he wrote this psalm, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters get along in unity. When you read the Old Testament and when you read the New Testament, we find in a variety of occasions, God's people sometimes don't get along. Sometimes they quarrel. Sometimes they backbite. Happens all throughout Scripture. And it's not pleasing to the Lord. But here we are in 2014, and it continues to go on. Everybody has their quarrels, and we all need to learn to walk together in love. And when these kingdoms came together, David just celebrated how good and pleasant this is. Why is this unity so important? Well, there's some, there's some pictures that we get out of this psalm that are significant. And they have everything to do with the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit isn't mentioned by name. See, we all have the same spirit. We share Christ together, we share the Bible together, we worship together, we share this gospel message to the community together. We are headed all for the same heaven. We are bound together by the Holy Spirit. That's why this is so good and pleasant. We are family. The Bible says that we belong to each other. Look to the person next to you and say, we belong together. Say it to each other. Yeah, look at there. Some of you are saying all at one service. Uh-uh-uh. We're going to fill those seats. In verse 2 of Psalm 133, we're anointed by the same Spirit. See, in the Old Testament, at the ordination of a priest, oil was poured all over them. And you could see that it was, it was probably even appeared a little bit messy, but water was poured right down the face on the beard as this priest, this priest was ordained. And when you look at the descriptors of what uh, the, the high priest actually wore, they wore this necklace with 12 stones around them. So when it talks about the oil going by the collar and everything, the oil literally poured down on these 12 stones. And you know what these 12 precious stones represented? It represented God's people, 12 tribes. 
You see the unity in all of that? And then when you ask, well, what, what, what's the deal with the oil? Well, what this anointing of oil, we go to the New Testament, and it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so here we are, still part of this New Testament church, and we're anointed with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit literally pours all over us, all over our entire beings, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters get along together. That's the message that we have. He was literally bathed in oil. We're literally bathed in the Holy Spirit, all of us. We're without excuse. The only thing that can get in the way of the unity that God's designed us for is me and you. But when we surrender to that, that gushing of the Spirit coming through us, there are no limits to what God can do through that church. Amen. And what happens then is he goes from talking about this oil to do. You know, a lot of you uh, are familiar with farming, uh, have relatives that farm. We know that dew is good. Dew is moisture. Moisture is good for crops. And so that dew that's talked about here in Psalm 133, it represents all that, life. We also know what drought means. And we also know what it means to walk on a, on a field that hasn't had water on it, and it's dried, and it's cracked, and it looks dead. So that death and decay comes through that dryness, yet dew, moisture, represents life. And dew symbolizes the life-giving Word of God. God's Word refreshes His people. When things are dry, they fall apart. When things are moist and wet and nurtured, they live and they thrive. Life means unity, and death means decay and discord. And so this do is describing this, this community that's filled with life and will continue to flourish, and that's how God's designed us. So here we are as a church. We're one of thousands of local churches, and one of our big goals is unity living in community. That's our challenge, and God has given us everything that we need to accomplish that. When we capture community, it will protect us. When we capture the essence of community that the Lord has designed us for, it protects us from things like shallowness and failure. You know, it all starts in Genesis 1. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing for a pastor to say at the beginning of the sermon. It starts in Genesis 1, and it goes throughout the whole Scriptures. But listen to this, Genesis 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit, hear that, Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Genesis 1, 1 to 3, what we see right there, right there at the beginning, is community. The Spirit was over creation, the protector of it. The Father spoke, and it was created. And of course, Jesus, the Son, is the Word. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. They were all there in unity, in community. And that was just at Genesis 1. It's hard to get our heads around God, isn't it? But before Genesis 1, 1 started, there was an eternity before. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lived in perfect community together. God is all about community. And then when he created Adam, it wasn't long after that that he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so he created Eve, community. And jump forward to the New Testament. And remember when Jesus was praying, he was praying so fervently there before he was crucified. And he prayed, Father, make them one. Make them one. Bind them together. Make them one. He went so far as to say, the world will know that you have sent me when you make them one. 
oneness, community, unity, so important to the Father. And of course, we know that there's this, when God created man, there was this perfect unity that existed between God and man. They walked together. They had, they had this relationship that was like none other until humanity sinned, and then it was broken. And so here we are living in a broken world, and we're proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ to others. So because of Jesus, we can be bridged to the Father until one day when we go to heaven, and that unity, that perfect unity is reestablished. Community and unity, it's all throughout the scriptures. We know that Jesus went away and he was at times alone, but he gathered with his disciples. That's the first small group that he had going there. And then he also pulled away from some of the disciples and he took a few of them. Peter, James, and John he also went alone with. It was a common thing for him to do. And the practice of the early church, and, and they were living in oneness. You could see that throughout the book of Acts. And, and what they would do is they would go to church on Sunday, but they would also gather in people's homes. This community and unity were so important to everybody. And the closeness that you could achieve in somebody's home was so significant. And so they met in the big church, which probably wasn't nearly as big as this. And then they also met in little church. Because things can happen in little church that don't happen in big church. And that's why God calls us into those types of communities. And think about this for a moment. When it, when it comes to the world that we live in, we seem to always be defined in our relationships by our differences. Conservatives, liberals, Republicans, Democrats, contemporary, traditional. Everybody seems to be defined in relationship by their differences. And yet here we are in the church, and what are we defined by? The same Spirit, one Lord, one Scripture, together. And this binds us together with literally cords that cannot be broken. And we're so grateful for that. True community is based upon oneness in Christ. And we need to recapture that. Can you imagine just for a moment a place in community, not just in big church, but as, as we get together in our little communities that people all over the church are just saying, it just can't get better than this. I mean, it just doesn't get better than this. Have you looked around and seen these people? These people are just so great to be with, to share life with, to grow old with. That's how God designed community to be. And when the community of God starts living like that, they will radiate in ways that people will scratch their heads out there and say, what's going on here? That they love each other so, so much. A life that gets bigger because of authentic community will never return to its original size. My wife and I have taken such joy over many years of having people into our home in small communities. We get to be a part of big church and that's a great privilege. But we love what can happen in our living room or our family room. And we've loved to see life change take place there. And we've loved seeing the body come around people in, in right there in the living room. And we take such joy in that. And that's for everybody here to be a part of something like that. I've taken great joy in giving lots of money to Denny's over the year, just sitting across the table with a, lot of, a couple other men. I know some of you are thinking he's had too many grand slams, but... I don't do that anymore. But the fact of the matter is there's rich community that takes place right across the table there. God's designed us for that. So what's this community to look like? So in the few moments before we come to this precious table here, I just want to give a couple handles for us with regards to community. This will show up on your outline. What should community look like? Well, community is a family gathering where we celebrate God's activity. Where are some of the best discussions in your house? I hope in the kitchen or wherever the kitchen table is. The kitchen table becomes a precious place where so many family discussions are had and when our kids were growing up, we'd, that, that was our gathering place at the end of the day. How was your day? What's going on? What are you happy about? What are you challenged about? The kitchen table, just such a great place to be. A kitchen table is where people will listen. He's talking, we listen. He's talking, we listen. And the kitchen table is this great place where I think God has designed us to live in community together. 
What does the Bible say? The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gladness be evident to all. What are we supposed to be evident to all? Gladness. Gladness. So this week, we're together with our family. Every night we got to sit around the table and we ate breakfast together. What a rare treat. And we just sit there and we talk and we chat. And we're checking in on each other's lives. How's it going? What's blessing you? What's God teaching you? How can we pray for you? And it becomes sweet times together. When people come into our house for, we call it a life group, but when people come into our house, we, we, we love, my wife and I, just to look around the expanse and see people talking out on the patio and people talking at the dining room table and people talking in the family room. See, that's, that's precious community because what we see is we see people listening and people talking and people just sharing life together. I believe that's the way church is defined. See, we don't get to do that too much in here because right now you've got somebody's neck in front of you. We don't talk well to necks. We talk well to faces. So whenever we get an opportunity to get in a circle around a table or in a couch in a coffee table, we can talk to people and we can share. And we can ask questions like, what is, what's God doing in your life right now? How's God speaking to you? How are you challenged? Or we can do what we often do. So how's the weather? See the USC game yesterday? Now, there's place for small talk amongst even Christians. But the question is, is where does the big talk happen? Where does the deep talk happen? Where are you able to go deeper with somebody? And if that's a void in your life, that's not how God designed you. He designed all of us to be able to have the big talk, the deep talk, and to enjoy deeper community with people. Rejoicing is fun. Don't let your church drive you into depression. This is meant to be a fulfilling place, a fruitful place, a place where we grow together. And so we're called to get into small communities where we can celebrate and listen and share together. So community is a family gathering. The next place is community is a fitness center that builds people up, a fitness center. You'll love to go to a fitness center, right, to work out, to exercise. Well, this is what small communities can be. Therefore, the Bible says, encourage one another and build each other up. What are we supposed to do to each other? Build each other up. Now, I know this is kind of unbelievable, but hear me out because it's true. There was a season in my life where I had a personal trainer. Okay, get that over with. Now... I was convinced that the personal trainer was directly related to Satan. <laughs> I asked on a few occasions, are you trying to kill me? And this young man, about 23, 24 years of age, said this, I'm trying to build you up. I'm trying to help you live longer. And I thought, that's really scriptural. See, community is meant to build each other up. And, and we're, we're, we're here to, to, to pump each other up. And it comes through exercise and it comes through hard work. And the reason I had a disdain for that little season of my life that I need to return to sometime is because it was so hard. It was much easier to get in the car and go and have a donut. It's much easier in a community like this to push away from the table and say, I'm going to go somewhere else to be anonymous over there than to do the hard work it is to build and work on community together. And that's why community can be described as a fitness center. And that's why sometimes people will walk up to each other and say, you know what, I know you're going through a hard time and I want you to know I am willing to walk through that with you. I am willing to walk alongside of you. And in that journey, it can get messy because it can be very unpredictable what will happen in that, but that's what authentic community begins to look like. I am there for you. So there's probably three exercises we can do in this. The first one is aerobic kneeling. 
We, we take time to pray. We get down on our knees. We want to get the heart pumping. If we want to get that going, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray with each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to pick up the phone and call and pray with people. When there are calls to come and pray, we pray because that's what Christians do. We pray. You know what? When it boils right down to it, exercise means move more. In the Christian life, the greatest spiritual exercise is pray more. And that's what we do. I remember in a, in, a, in a trying season of my own life, there was times, and this happened three times a week, at least three times a week, I'd go out at about 5.15 in the morning and I'd pick up my paper from my driveway. And there was a car that sat right in the front of my house. And it was one of my elders that would sit and he'd pray for me in his car three times a week because when he said, I'll walk with you in this, he was going to walk with me in this. That's what community is to be like, sitting and praying with people. We're supposed to pump scriptural iron. So we, we do these different exercises and we, and, and we have to pump scriptural iron because one of the things we need to do is we need to get this word in us. God has asked us to do so much, the great commission, the great commandment, bring this gospel message forward, being disciple makers, all this. We need the tools. We need to get this scripture in us. Out there is a ton of opportunities to get engaged in the scripture. So we must be in the word. Can you do that alone? Yes. But are we called to do that in community? Yes. So men, men, lead the way here. Why are there always more women in Bible studies and churches than men? Not hearing any answers. <laughs> men, let's take the lead there. Men, can you say amen? Men, let's take the lead there. Amen. amen. Men, if you get up in the morning, there's Bible studies at 630. Come to it. If you don't get up in the morning or you have to go to work in the morning, there's Bible studies at 7 o'clock at night. Men, set the example for your family. Get in a Bible study. Study the Word with other people. You will bless the socks off of your family when you do that. Women, keep going to Bible studies. Women who are in Bible studies, capture another woman this morning and bring them to your Bible study. We need to be in the Word. There's too much that are, there's too many challenges out there. We got to do that. We got to do that together. And then we need to run encouragement drills. So I remember doing these things in high school. They were called Weezers in the high school that I went to. Some call them suicides, you know, where you run to the half court line and you run back and you run down to the baseline and you come back and your coach says do 10 of them, also probably related to Satan. And I mean, we thought we were going to die. I didn't mean that. Um, he was a very good man. Uh, the fact of the matter was, was the coach doing that to punish us? No, he was doing that to train us, to condition us, so that we could make it through a whole game. And that's why we're called to get into the Word, because in order to get this gospel message out potently, we need to be trained, and we can only train by studying the Word, and we do it much better in community. And so we must practice encouragement daily to be conditioned. That's what God wants us to do to run encouragement drills and, pr and practice saying good things to other people. I've had this happen to me a variety of times where my cell phone will ring, I'll say, hello, and they'll say, who is this? You called me. <laughs> this is Bob Johnson. Oh, Bob, how are you? <laughs> Hope you're having a good day. Hey, you're the first on my speed dial and I must have accidentally just hit your name. Hope you have a good day. Okay, I'll take it. Even inadvertent encouragement is good, amen? And so we're called to bless other people and to encourage other people and to go around and, and, and well, just look around, even in this place. Look at the faces in this place. I bet anybody you asked this morning, how you doing? Doing great. Tell your face then. <laughs> right? I mean, people are in desperate need of encouragement. And so don't tell that to them, but, but tell them they look beautiful. Do something to get a smile on them, but we need to run encouragement drills, and we get to do that in community. I laugh this year, we're, we're hiking, and uh, my son Bob, he is such an encourager, and his mother and father were trudging up this hill to get done with this hike, and he knew that it was going to be a little far for one of his parental units, who I won't mention, but it's not me. 
So he, he literally figured out mathematically how many steps it was going to be, and every hundred steps he would say, only so many more, and somehow we were all encouraged by that. But that's just his makeup, and he encouraged and he blessed, and we're so grateful for that. You know, in our life group, one of the things that I'm so grateful for, I didn't know these people before they came into my home, but now I know this guy, John Ranga. You know, when you're with him for a few moments, you're going to be encouraged. He's going to bless you. And Nancy and Ruth Mena, they're these beautiful sisters who come in, and they always bless us. And so people drop these little encouragement bombs on you all the time, and it's such a blessing to be around that. That's what the church is meant to be, and we get to do that really potently in small communities. And then another thing about community, community is, is, is a launching pad for ministry. Listen to this. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. So what happens is this. I believe right now, sitting in chairs out here, there's undiscovered power. Because there's people here sitting in these chairs that profess Christ as their Savior. In a little bit, they're going to come forward to the table, and that's great. Praise the Lord. But they're not being used in ministry. Because, see, this can be an intimidating room, and the pastor can stand up here and say, everybody get involved. And everybody doesn't necessarily run out there and get involved. But what happens is when we get in small communities together, people start discovering things about each other and says, you're really good at that. You know, God has such a place for you in this church to, to use that very gift that you were just talking about. And so what happens is, is, is people in these small communities, it becomes a, a launching pad for ministry and people get discovered. And because they have the Holy Spirit in them, the Holy Spirit is power. And when you take power unit and power unit and power unit and power unit together, what happens is the church becomes an indestructible force, amen? And that's exciting, and that's what we get to do because there's a lot of people desperately in need of what the church brings, and we need to work together at it. And then community is also a laboratory for leadership. In the book of Exodus, it says, appoint them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. What's going on there? Well, what happened is, is Moses was struck with a, a malady that oftentimes leaders have, and he thought he could do everything. And he couldn't. So his father-in-law, whose name was Jethro, came to him and said, Moses, you've, you've got to employ, appoint some helpers. And we've got to organize this thing because you can't do everything. And so Moses did what his father-in-law said. And literally what happened is probably the first small group system in Scripture was established because it got organized. Now, no pastor can stand up here, and even if you have two, three, four, five, six pastors, the church is never designed for the pastors to do everything. Matter of fact, the Scripture is very clear. You're the ministers, and the pastors are the administers. And, and, and the staff is the administers, because the staff is literally extensions of the pastors. And so the church is most potent when the ministers are all using the gifts that God has given them. And we get to discover those gifts, and, and, and we get to see those gifts brought out and raised up in small communities. So one of the things that happens in the ministries that we have going on, it's not just a matter of doing youth ministry or children's ministry, but those ministries are done in community. And because they're done in community, these adults come together, and whether it's children's ministry, youth ministry, or women's ministries, or compassion ministries, they get to come together as community because this is their area that they have passion for, and they get to say, isn't this great? I mean, we get to bless kids, and we get to do this together as friends. Bless kids, do it together as friends. That's awesome. And then they invite more people into it. And those happy adults that are in it, they are bringing such blessing to the children or to the youth or to whomever that they're serving. And then ministries start growing. Ministries grow because there's happy servants living out their gifts of leadership and all sorts of other gifts in that context. That's how they grow. And so sometimes in ministry you hear, well, I could only commit one day a month to this ministry. Really? Really? I bet if you were doing it with four of your best friends, you could probably commit to every week. And that's what community is about. Or we could only commit to meeting, you know, our, our, our home group only met one time in the last four months. You know, we're really busy. Really? I mean, if you're really good friends, don't you want to get together? My wife and I have had times when we, we thought not many people would even come to our home. We were a little bit hoping that not so many would come. And they all came. 
And you know what that is? It's not us. It's not us. It's the people that come, they love being together. That's what the church is meant to be. We love being together. The final thing, community as a hospital for healing. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. It's from Galatians. Why do we need each other? Why do we need each other in small community? Because there's a lot of hurting people. Some are hurting right now, this moment, and they need people to gather around them. You know what? In times of crisis, I believe that the evil one can whisper in our ear, push away, go and be alone. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And one of the ways we come to Jesus is we come to those who are Holy Spirit filled in a community like this because we're called to bear each other's burdens. And we're, we're called to sit with, with each other in sometimes the sloppiness of life and the messiness and the garbage that can go on. And so, so sometimes it's just, it's just flat out providing care and so, is there pastoral care that comes through pastors? Yes. But is there an immense amount of pastoral care that happens right here in the body? Yes. Because, see, the body of Christ is so often going to serve as the emergency room. You know, when you go to the emergency room, you don't call ahead for an appointment. You just go in. And that's how the church often works. People just are in crisis, and they need somebody. And maybe the pastor's available, maybe a staff member's available, but really the Lord designed the body that we would be the emergency room. And what an empty feeling not to have an emergency room to go to because you're not in community in any way, so God calls us to be in community together. And then sometimes people need rehabilitative care. You know, rehabilitative care usually happens after somebody has surgery or they broke an arm or something, and, and then they come home and they just need somebody to, to walk with them and help them through just a get over a hump. That's what community does. And then we're called to be in community as a means of confession, to confess with each other. What does the book of James says? Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another, yes. Yes, that's hard. Doesn't come easy. Sometimes we need to confess that we're just not the husbands that we are supposed to be, men. Sometimes we confess that we're not the fathers we're supposed to be, or ladies, the mothers or the wives. And sometimes as we get specific with that, it's just hard. And then invariably when you're doing that in community, what happens is, is somebody else will speak up in the group and says, I know what you're going through. I've had that same feeling. And you look at them and you say, really? And somehow there's, there's a sense of encouragement and blessing in that because what we find out our people are real and they're messy. And, and people go through struggles and sometimes they wake up in the morning and they don't necessarily feel like loving their wife or their husband, and it's difficult. And they need encouragement and help along the way. Or sometimes their kids are driving them nuts, and they understand truly why some animals eat their young. And they, and they, can, and they, and they just need to get that out there so people can hear that. We need that. God's designed us for that, to be in community together. And safe people, safe, intimate people are essential in the body of Christ. And as good as this room looks this morning, this isn't necessarily a great safe place for somebody to stand up and confess their sins. But when you gather together with two, three, or four people, it is. And that's why all of our ministries need to be places where small communities exist and we can share life together. We're all weak, and transformation takes place at the edge of suffering. Here's the table that we're about to come to. 
But we can't come to this table without looking back at that cross. And see, that cross, you can see very clearly that there is a vertical beam and there is a horizontal beam. And that vertical beam, if we look at that, is just pointing straight up to God. And we love to worship and we say, I love you, Lord, and I've got 10,000 reasons to praise you. But when the Lord hung on that cross, he had his arms out because there's a horizontal beam there too because the ministry of Jesus Christ said, go love those people. Go love those people. Lord, it's way easier for me to just love you and to praise you. Love those people. I've died. I've died on this cross so that you can love those people and bring that message, that message of healing to those people. Lord, I don't know if I could do it. Yes, you can, because I'm going to give you grace, and this is grace. It's a symbol of God's great grace to us, and this is why we do this on a regular basis. Just like a family would come to dinner on a nightly basis, we do this on a regular basis because this is strength for the journey. The Lord knows that it's not always easy to love each other. The Lord knows that it's not always easy to bring that word out to others. The Lord knows that it's sometimes, it's hard to volunteer four times a month and to do all those ministries that are out there. He knows that. I'll give you strength. And what happens here at this table is this is a reminder, a vivid reminder of the strength that we have because Jesus hung on the cross and died for us. And then you know this, as we go out and love other people, starting as soon as this service is over, people are still going to be difficult. You know, there's some people that are probably in the church, and we could describe them as these, these, these gracious truth avoiders. Whatever. Whatever. They don't seem to have a standard. They say anything they want. They do anything they want. And they just want to love everybody and whatever, whatever. Gracious truth avoiders. And then there's other people, way at the other side. We can call them graceless truth inflictors. They walk around like this. Because they are going to tell the truth about everything, whether you want to hear it or not. And that's how they live their life. When they think about being in community with each other, they hope that they get together with a bunch of complainers. Because we're going to complain, and sometimes they complain about church, and sometimes they complain about the pastor, and sometimes they complain about those people, whoever those people are. Graceless truth in flickers. John chapter 1 says Jesus came to live in grace and truth. Not in those ditches. And this is the challenge he has for us as a church to live as a community of grace and truth. And look at Jesus' life and look at the way he dealt with people and what do you see first? grace and truth that will set you free. And Cross Point Church, I believe that God has given us the tools and the strength to do that so that we could arrive at a point where we could say, it doesn't get any better than this in the community that God's given to us. And so we come to the table this morning in humility. And we come to the table, and I wish we were all sitting around it, because it's just meant to be like a kitchen table, and we could look around at each other's faces, and we realize we need each other, and we need what each other brings around the table together in community. There's a big mission out there. And we get to do that together, and the Lord's providing grace. Let's pray.
Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you for calling us to be a community, a real community, a community that's filled with messiness, but your grace has taken care of all of that. A community that's filled with brokenness, a community that continues to see breakdowns happen along the way. But Lord, as you strengthen us for the journey and you've strengthened us to love each other, there's always somebody there that can be there to pick people up and to encourage and to bless and to pray for. And so Lord, as you're giving us strength for this journey now in this table and in the bread and the cup, we say thank you. And we thank you for being the initiator of grace in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for inviting us to this table this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.